Chag Sameach. As time wears on in this period of social distancing, which we are doing, of course, to preserve our health within our community, I'm thinking about something that inevitably will come. I'm thinking about the first hug after social distancing, the first hug outside of our immediate family, the first handshake, that first sign of closeness, of intimacy. What will that feel like? Will it be scary? Will it be tentative at first? Will it be cathartic? Will we cry? Will we shrink back, unsure whether there's still some taboo against this, even as we're doing it? Will it feel awkward in some way? I've been thinking a lot about how to hug and how to express nearness and how whether nearness is the way in which and the only way in which we express our love in this time of distancing. My colleague and friend, Rabbi Andrew Markowitz, speaks of his concern that we've taught our children to stay back from people not in our household. How are we going to re-instill that sense of trust that is so much a part of the innate sense of innocence in childhood? Our assumption, not just in Judaism, but societally with our norms, is that near means loving and far is, well, distant. It's aloof. It's maybe unloving. But this is not so clear, especially in a time of enforced distance and isolation. And so today, as we head into Shavuot, I want us to have an opportunity to think about and relearn again how to hug. Closeness in a time of social distancing. When, as I sit here alone in this sanctuary at Adith Israel, when we decided to redo the sanctuary, there was an assumption that we needed to reimagine the space because initially, as you can see in this picture from the multicolored facade with the chuppah under it, even in this moment of closeness and love, you can see that the bima was some four and a half, five feet high in the air. You can see how far people are from the content of the service, whether it be a wedding or a liturgical service in another way. When more kids started to come to the services on Shabbat, we used to have to post volunteers along the front when they came up for candy at the end of services in the fear that some of them would come falling off. But this was a sanctuary, beautiful as it was, that was built decades ago in a time when feeling connected was seeing the symbolic Moses on high. Distant was what drew us in. I'll show you the after picture. You can see it here. The sanctuary now is in the round with people as close as possible. And the, the ar architects were asked, how can we make a huge space feel near, feel intimate? That was that idea that being near was the way in which we show love and connectivity. And now in a time of social distancing, that assumption is turned on its head because our act of distancing in this moment is an act of love. It's an act of chesed, of caring, of boundless, unconditional love. That's what chesed is, and it is chesed because it is a pure love. There is no recompense expected. Indeed, many of us are hurting, whether economically or with the toll that it's taken on mental health. There is no payoff or very little payoff for those self-interested with this social distancing. It has its challenges. This is true chesed and chesed love that comes from distance, not from nearness. And so with that in mind, I'd like us to perhaps reconsider the moment that we mark on Shavuot and certainly in the days leading into Shavuot, the moment of Mount Sinai. We are told, We should bound the people off all around. 
and you can see, of course, my Grover, classic Grover pictures, the near and far pictures. Uh, they remind me a little bit of those who are early and they're getting accustomed to Zoom, uh, where people were all together too close or too far from the screen, from the camera. It's a desire to be close. It's a reaching out in that way. But I want to look at this verse, Vihig Balta et Am Saviv. It asks us to bound off not the mountain, which was the original understanding of this, the classic understanding typically is that the mountain was bounded off and the people were excluded or outside from that space of communion between God and Moshe for the receiving of the Torah. And that is made further ambiguous when Moshe reveals his understanding of what it means for the, for the bounding off here. In the second verse we have on this slide, we see Vayomer Moshe el Adonai lo yuchal ha'am la'alot el har Sinai. Moses reminds God that, that the people cannot come on Mount, si Mount Sinai ki ata ha'edot ha'banu lemor hagbel et ha'har v'kidashto. Moses understands the mountain to have been bounded off and the people kept out. There is an ambiguity, ambiguity of perspective, of directionality between who or what is being bounded off from whom or what. And maybe this ambiguity allows a different way of understanding. Clearly, the idea of bounding off the mountain comes with a certain harshness. It's not very welcoming. The end of the first verse you have says, mot yumat. Uh, you shall surely die. You're really going to die. That's not feel-good language. But maybe that is intended to share a certain urgency of a protectiveness. Anyone who has seen a child, perceived a child to be in imminent danger, maybe a child running out towards a street, you get urgent. You get you get uh, frantic. You want to squeeze that child and hold that child back. And so maybe the Hagbalah, the bounding off in both of these verses, might be understood more as a hug of restraint, an urgent hug of restraint, more than something more punitive. And because of this sort of bi-directional perspective of who or what is being bounded, that ambiguity gives us some room to play. Maybe it's intended as an embrace an act of caring, a bounding off, a hug. And indeed, isn't a hug in some ways a form of bounding off? I know that when my kids observe my wife and me hugging, instinctively, they want to be a part of that. They, they feel left out. They sort of nuzzle their way into the hug to say, I want to be in this. And that's only augmented by the last word of the verse 23, v'kidash to. What is the act of bounding off? It's something that sanctifies, makes it sacred, extraordinary. It's, uh, kidash to is from kadosh, from the, it's like the room in the house where we only go when guests are here. It's from the word hektesh, to be consecrated for something in service of God, in the temple perhaps. It's not supposed to be common. It's supposed to be like a hug, designated something as particular, as exclusive in the most special and loving way. It's why, for example, we're told not to use our synagogues as a kapandria, as a, as a shortcut to pass through. This is sacred space. And especially if there is some danger perceived, something urgent happening, the harshness, even up to the words figuratively mot yumat, this keeping away may be an act of love. God says this to Moses when Moses wants to feel as close as possible to God. God says, listen, I'm going to place you firmly in the cleft of the rock and keep you there. And when I pass by, only then will you see me. That poetic image in Anim's Mirot of only seeing the back knot of God's tefillin. God is saying that not to be punitive to Moshe. God is saying that out of care, out of love. And so we see in this moment that perhaps distancing is love. 
is protection. We see that also in the image of Moshe coming down the mountain with such a radiant face that it actually scares the people. Moses calls them closer, asking them to be near, but even so, Moses has to place a veil between his face and that of the people, a veil of protection. It feels in some way like trying to give a speech or sing a song through a mask. It's an act of love and protection, even as it feels like an act of distancing. We know that the veil, that intermediary, is an act of love and protection from an earlier time when the veil happens. This perhaps is the most famous veiling, though we tell a different story in the context of the Bedeccan, the veiling before a wedding, most famously with the tell the story of Jacob and getting the wrong bride between Rachel and Leah at his wedding. But in truth, the liturgy of the Bedeccan, Achoteinu Ateil Alfer comes from the generation before that, when Isaac, who had an arranged marriage to Rebecca, he was, you know, the wedding, the morning of his wedding, he was understandably nervous. And so he decided to take a walk to clear his head. And wouldn't you know that as he's taking the walk along the side of the road, the caravan bringing Rebecca in and in preparation for the wedding day comes by and their eyes meet by accident. And in the ancient world, the way in which a woman would show immediate breathtaking love is that she would cover her face with a veil. A veil, even that distancing, even that separation, is an act of love. People who don't know how to use the camera on Zoom or where the camera is, when they reach out like that, it's a desire to be near. It's a desire to be close. When we, in our early childhood, Havdalah or Shabbat experiences, we have oftentimes in this time of social distancing and, and quarantine, we've had grandparents get on just so they can see their kids singing and dancing and having fun. And we tell the grandparents that even if you're not with your kids, you can place your hands up towards the camera as if to offer the bracha to them. And we tell the kids to bend their heads in close. There's a desire to be near, even when there is, in fact, a screen intervening between us. And you know, distancing as an act of love can be something that is also true in some of life's most difficult times. I'm gonna teach a text now that is a very difficult text and one that is harsh, I wanna warn you, but I think that we can learn something from its starkness. For this text, I wanna thank our teacher, Professor Bert Vizotsky. This is a story of Rabbi Meir and the loss of two of his children, but really, frankly, it's a story of Gruria, his wife. The story comes from uh, the Midrash of Mishle, the end of the book of Proverbs, offering interpretation on the phrase, Eshet we learn a story about Rabbi Meir he was giving a drasha, he was speaking and teaching on Shabbat afternoon. And at that time, unbeknownst to him at home, two of his sons died. At this point in time, it's a little odd in the text. It's unclear as to uh, who, whose mother it is, because uh, at least as I learned this text, it seems that we're talking about Bruria here. It seems it's the son's mother, namely Rebbe Meir's wife, Bruria. What did she do? She lays them out on the bed. She spreads a sheet over them. And finally, Rebbe Meir, completely unknowing what the tragedy that had happened, comes home. And he says, where are my boys? And Berea says, They went to be with you at work. And he says, Amarla, he says to her, I, I looked all around. I was expecting them. None, no, they weren't there. At this point, you would think that Berea would break down over the loss of their shared children. But still, she has a sense of emotional and time based difference, distance, excuse me. She gives him a cup and tells him to make Havdalah. 
She gives him a meal. Again, he asks, where are my kids? And she says, oh, they'll be coming. They must be out someplace. He offers Birkat Amazon. And then Buri asks a question. She says, Rabbi, she'el achat yeshli lish'olecha. I have a question to ask you. And he says, go ahead. She says, Rabbi, kodem ayom, ba adam echad, v'natan li pikadon, v'achshav, ba li toloto, nagzir lo, o lo. Someone gave me a precious deposit, a treasure to, I've been entrusted, and now he's come back to take it. Should I give it back to him? And he says, of course you should. This is the law. And Buria then says, Rabbi, chutz midatcha, lo ayiti no tenet etzlo. Thanks to you, I understand what is next to be done. And so she shows him then in the back room his deceased children. And he, of course, is distraught. He says, Banai, Banai, Rabbi, Marbai. He says, my, my sons, my teachers, my sons, because uh, of course you came from generationally from me and from my wife, my teachers. Why my teachers? They became my Rabbi Mayer, literally is what it says. They enlightened my eyes, but they literally, it says, they were my Rabbi Mayer. If I am Rabbi Mayer to the world, they, are what made, they, they, were, they were what made me Rabbi Mayer in some way. And the story continues that Bruria says, is this not what we did? We're giving them back to God? At which point he quotes Job saying, Adonai Natan, Adonai Lakach, Yishem Adonai Mevorach. That God has given us these lives, God takes. And God, tragically, at this moment, we still bless God even in this moment of tragedy. But Rabbi Hanina tells this story and, and reports on this story, the Dvar Azeh, at this moment, this was an act of consolation. I have to say, it feels what Beruria did, an almost absurd act of self-control and self-distancing, what we maybe call a non-anxious presence to such an extreme, I would have thought that she would have rushed to be close to her husband at the Beit Midrash or at least sent someone to bring him home, not to let him finish his lesson, his shiur. I would think that the moment he got home, she would have fallen into his arms and taken him back there, but still she distances him. She allows him in this act, in the rabbinic mind at least, an act of chesed, of love. She allows him to be a rabbi first, this area of professional comfort before she's going to give him this information that is gonna change his life forever, that is going to take him out of any sense of comfort that he could possibly have. She gives him food. She lets him finish Shabbos. And only then does she usher him into this act of mourning. And how does she do it? She does it by asking him a halachic question. Again, by placing him in his area, in his place of comfort. She takes this act of distancing in almost superhuman control. Rabbi Vizatsky offered that with one small letter change, Bruria can become Bloria or Valoria, which means actually a Shetchayil, the verse that is being interpreted in this moment. She is, in fact, the teacher here. Outdated gender roles aside of giving him food and the like, in truth, it is Bruria who is our teacher. And what does she teach us? She teaches us that within the rabbinic way of understanding things, that this is some sense of consolation, that this is some sense of comfort, that distancing from the proximal tragedy is some act of love. One final thought on this related to Shavuot. We have been meeting online on Zoom for our weekday minyan, and we've started based on a passing comment that I made, a belief that if you know a couple dozen, a few dozen words and their roots uh, in Hebrew, you can understand a significant percentage of the liturgy, of the tefillah. And one of the first words that we chose because of our, our moment of social distancing was karov, this idea of being near, which also is related to korban, the sacrifice, an, an act, a ritual act in ancient times of seeking to be near to God. And so I challenged 
those attending Minyan in that day to look for that root as they went through the liturgy. And one of the times a congregant and friend of mine found the word, uh, the following word or root, bikarov, which he saw lining up the translation with the Hebrew means soon. And something here I think was uh, brought out in that moment that I, I appreciate my friend Jeff as a teacher as well, because I reflected with him that in Hebrew, just as with Bruria in the Rabbi Meir story, oftentimes Hebrew sort of conflates space or place and time. The temporal and the geographic often have the same words. So something that is near in time might also use the same word, kuf, resh, bet, that is near in place. We also see this, for example, in the word olam, the word for world or universe, that the full expanse of known and understood space has the same word as, same, same root word as leolam or meolam, the full expanse of known or comprehended time. And so this idea of being near can be one of proximity in space or proximity in time. And this is going to be important as we pivot into Shavuot for the last few moments of our time together. Because this conflating of time and place is something that perhaps was done most beautifully by our teacher, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. It was key to his influential understanding of Shabbat. Rabbi Heschel writes, that this idea is a radical departure from accustomed religious thinking. The mythical mind would expect, he says, that after heaven and earth had been established, God would create a holy place, a holy mountain, or a holy spring, whereupon a sanctuary is to be established. This is, was certainly the predominant practice in the context in which Judaism grew up. And yet he says, it seems as if to the Bible, it is holiness in time, the Sabbath, which comes first. He continues, when history began, there was only one holiness in the world, holiness in time. When at Sinai, the word of God was about to be voiced, a call for holiness in man, when humankind was proclaimed, thou shalt be unto me a holy people. It was only after the people had succumbed to the temptation of worshiping a thing, a golden calf, that the erection of the tabernacle, a holiness in space, was commanded. The sanctity of time came first, Rabbi Heschel says. The sanctity of humankind came second, and the sanctity of space came last. Time was hallowed by God. Space, the tabernacle, was consecrated by Moses. And so, it is at this moment of approaching Mount Sinai, commemorated on Shavuot, that we experience this conflation, this real co collapsing almost of time and space. There is no near and far. Because we understand this moment of Sinai as if all of us stood, bounded off or embraced or hugged away from the mountain at Sinai. No matter where we are in the world, no matter when in the Jewish time continuum of history we exist, no matter when in our lifetimes we join Judaism, whether by birth or later by choice, no matter where we have lived, no matter where we have traveled, we all find ourselves with time and space collapsing in closeness, in proximity to one another at this point of Mount Sinai. You know, the Talmud does this in its rhetorical fashion as well. Rabbis in the Talmud can talk to one another across generations, across geographies. Abaye speaks to Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva speaks to Moshe Rabbeinu as if we're sitting right across from one another. And we learn their words as if we are in immediate and direct conversation with them, with no distance of time or space whatsoever. And I think the lesson is that even when we are far in time or space, we are not, we are never that aloof. And it, the distance itself may be an act of love. Indeed, the fact that we have endured so long may be testament to that act of love. The fact that the time is so long should be, can be, 
a sense of that love. We have shown that we can collapse distance, at least partially, in these times of separation through technologies like Zoom. We have shown that we can collapse the distance of time and space through the way that the Talmud speaks, going all the way back to Mount Sinai, that however far we are from Mount Sinai, we actually see ourselves as quite in love with that moment, that moment that we imagine as the chuppah, as the marriage, the covenantal bond between God and the people. Even if that Mount Sinai is bounded off, is veiled off, is hugged off, embraced to keep us protectively, lovingly, it is still metaphorically the chuppah in which we show our covenantal love with God. And so these models can be a template for us to learn how we can still feel loved, embraced, how we can still feel hugged, even when we are distant. And so I'd like to conclude with a prayer that the love that we send forth at this time should always feel accessible. And the love that we feel coming through these media should always feel accessible, even when we are unable to be physically near, even when there is literally a screen, sort of modern day veil between us and our loved ones. That the distance, I pray, imposed by this moment be felt and experienced as an expression of love, even as it is difficult and painful. And my bracha for you is that whenever it comes, and it will come, that first hug or handshake, that first expression of intimacy and nearness, that first hug should feel like a continuation of the outreach that we've been striving to attain in this time of loving distance. Sending love, sending care, in whatever ways we may, let it feel like a hug. Chag Sameach.